ladies and gentlemen, today I am joined by the one and only legendary fighter, comedian, uh, extraordinaire, UFC analyst, legendary coach, the one and only Mr. Dean Thomas. What's going on, Dean? I'm good, man. I didn't know you thought about me that way, but I'm honored to be on the show today. Brother, come on, man. Everything I said is true, especially the comedian stuff. You are fucking hilarious <laughs> on social media, man. <laughs> I like to pick on you guys, man. You guys are so easy to pick on, man. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You do pick on all of us quite a lot. Even Dana White. You, you always take the piss out of Dana as well. Well, you know what? I think I'm one of the only people in the world that can because we do the show together. Dana White looking for a fight. And like that's the dynamic of our relationship. So he allows me to pick on him. It's funny. Yeah. yeah. No, no, yeah. it's perfect. It's perfect. Listen, Dean, you're perfect to join us today as well. Uh, because obviously the UFC 299 going down this weekend. Um, Dustin Poirier's fighting. You used to coach at ATT, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. Yes, yeah, so you know with Dustin. Yeah, so I worked with Dustin for a little bit. In fact, like when I was still fighting, me and Dustin were just straight training partners. Right. Then when I retired, you know, I did work with him a few times for a few of his fights. But what a tremendous athlete and human being that man is. Oh, 100 percent. We'll get to that in a second. So how have you found that, Dean? Obviously, you know, from being a coach, uh, sorry, from being a fighter to now being a coach and also an analyst for the UFC. How's that whole journey been? You know, I mean, the thing is, Mike, getting started in this game in the in the mid 90s. You know, I've done it all. So, like, for me, when people talk about, oh, you're a coach or you're this, you're that, I feel like I've done everything that MMA has to offer. Like, really. Like, it's from promoting my own shows to grappling tournaments to coaching to owning schools to a little bit of everything. So, I've done everything in this game. So, I just love being still being a part of it. Yeah, no, that and, and that's incredible, Dana. When you say the mid nineties, I mean that's wild. I mean, people say to me in England, they're very kind. They say pioneer and stuff like that. The mid flipping nineties, though. I mean, how's as somebody involved in those days then to where it is now? Did you ever think this would happen? Never in a million years. Not in a million years. I remember thinking, man, I wish people took our sport seriously. That's what that's what was on my mind back in the early 2000s and late 90s. They didn't take the sport serious. So I was always wanting, man, like, when are we going to be on ESPN? When are they going to take us serious? When, why can't we get treated like real athletes? And now to see where we are today, I'm just blown away. I really am. I'm blown away. To be able to sit on airplanes and watch fights on ESPN, like, it's, it just blows my mind. Yeah, but I'm happy. Yeah, I, I'm happy. I should have said the fashion forward, Dean Thomas, as well, because you love a good cravat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very posh in that sense, Mike. I'm very posh. No, and I love it. I love it. How was So when you say mid-90s, what was the first UFC event that you ever fought on? I fought on UFC 31, and that was in 2001. Yeah. So I fought yeah. BJ Penn in 2001, and... um. Obviously, I got knocked out. That was my first UFC fight. <laughs> I got knocked out. I was like, damn, no, help somebody. Come get me. And then um, and then I came back for UFC. That was 32. I'm sorry. UFC 32, I got knocked out. Then I came back for UFC 33. That was in September, just after 9-11. And I fought Fabiano Iha. And that was the very first fight in Las Vegas. Very first sanctioned fight in Las Vegas, and I fought on that that card. So, um, Fabiano Ehab, wow, that's yeah. a name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah, so that was back in two thousand one. What was the event where you knocked out your good friend and colleague Matt Serra? Oh uh, well, <laughs> I think that was that was uh, forty one. I think that was forty one, and that was in Atlantic City. And but but I didn't I didn't knock him out, man. We had a we had a good little scrap. A head kick, right. Oh, no, I no, 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 no. Yeah, that was Eve Edwards oh. and, uh, and Josh Thompson. Don't oh, worry. Listen, crap. everybody, everybody gets that wrong. And in, oh, in, really? fact, in fact, we were doing an episode of Dana White looking for a fight. And I'm sitting next to Habib and Habib's like, hey, man, you knocked out my friend. And I'm like, who? He's like, Josh Thompson. And I'm like, no, man, that's um, that, that was Eve Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit listen as I say uh, I thought you'd be perfect to speak to you today with UFC 299 are you in Miami yeah I'm in my well I'm, I live down here so um, I'm pretty close 
Yeah, yeah. So Dustin Poirier, you know him very well. Give you give us your overall thoughts on the events, the fights, and all the rest of it, and then give us some insight into Dustin versus Benoit Sandini. I mean, I love this event. I mean, when this event started shaping up, everybody was excited for it because just the magnitude of the card and the the fights of on the card. I mean, when you think about it, when you look at the prelims, fights on the prelims. In fact, the main event on the prelims was actually supposed to be a main event. In Brazil, Jelton Almeida versus Curtis Blades. That was a main event in Brazil until Curtis Blades got hurt. And then when you look at fights like Mateos Gamrot taking on RDA, I mean, all these fights on the prelims could be main events at the apex. So stand alone, this is a tremendous card, one of the best cards that we've seen in a long time. And I think that it's going to live up to the hype because we got a lot of matchups, key matchups that look like veterans versus young guys. So it's a matter of... Do these veterans still have it? Can they hold their spot? Or is it time for the young guys to come up? So a lot of exciting storylines on this card. Mm. But no more than Dustin Poirier and Benoit St. Denis talking about veterans and -and up-and-comers. I mean, this is a dangerous fight for Dustin. He knows it. That's the reason why he took this fight. But I think he needs to take a fight like this because, you know, these guys at the top, you have to be able to give opportunities to young guys. Because you got an opportunity once, you got to be able to return the favor. And if you can't win these spots, then maybe you don't deserve to be there. So I think it's it's a perfect fight for Dustin if he can win. If he doesn't win, I think this is a situation where he might need to look into into the mirror and ask himself, does he really still want to do this? Yeah, which is funny you say that because he did mention this week. He said, every time I fight these days, being, what is he, 35, now 36, it can always be the last one potentially. Uh, Benoit Saint-Denis, though, is the opposite side of the spectrum. Five in a row, five wins, five stoppages, very, very young, dynamic fighter, very, very well-rounded. What do you think about this matchup? Who do you think walks away the winner? I mean, it's, it's a tremendous matchup. I mean, Benoit Saint-Denis has been, absolutely brilliant inside the octagon he's got knockout wins he's got submission wins so he seems to be able to do it all do it all but when you're fighting somebody like dustin the one thing he is lacking is experience and dustin said okay i know he's lacking experience because you know he hasn't doesn't have the cage time that i have so let's make this five rounds and let's make him sit and think about what he's going to do for 25 minutes which could be a problem for him dustin's idea i think so i think so i think that was dustin's idea I'm sure Dustin, and and speaking of Dustin, I I spoke to him and he said, yeah, he definitely wanted the five rounds, the extra two rounds, because when you get extra two rounds, it's a completely different pacing. You can't go out and throw the type of power that Benoit St. Denis does that early. You can, but it's a gamble because you're going to have to try to save some of that for later. And Dustin knows that. So for that reason, I am favoring Dustin to have the experience in this fight, to drag this later on and to wear Benoit St. Denis out. Sly old dog. That's yeah. a sly old dog right there. <laughs> That's a good For sure. Dog. For sure. If, if it was three rounds, I would probably go the other way. But in a five rounder, I think Dustin should be able to maintain his safety early on, not get caught with nothing crazy, not overextend himself and just move around and play cat and mouse for a little bit. And then, start to chop away as this fight progresses. Amazing. Um, You know, one of the first times I ever saw you in person, Dean, I think it was in Macau when Tyrone Woodley was fighting. Was it Don Young Kim? Yeah, yeah. The stun gun. The stun gun. Yeah, the stun gun. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you still see Tyrone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just talked to him the other day. That's, That's my boy, man. He's always doing something, man. That's the most resilient individual I've ever met. I mean, he's a guy who it doesn't matter what happens to him. He lost his last like four or five fights in the UFC. Then he goes and gets knocked out by Jake Paul, but you still can't tell him nothing. He's still the man. You know, he's still yeah, yeah, he's yeah. still doing his thing. But you know what, Mike? That's not the first time I saw you. The oh, very God, first time on. I know. <laughs> no, <laughs> wait a minute. This is I Get swear, ready to I swear. This out, everybody. <laughs> I swear this is good. You're gonna love this one. It okay. was it was before that whole Dung Young Kim thing. I I was in LA shooting like this reality show. It was like like low budget reality show. We were shooting a pilot and we went into a club. And inside the club, you and Rampage Jackson were on the dance floor with your shirts off, twirling it around, doing the helicopter. I swear to God. (laughs) I swear to God. And I was like, I was because, you know, I was I was just kind of doing my thing at the time. You was you was the man and you and Rampage was the man and you was in there Uh. swirling your shirt around. 
shirtless oh, in the God. club. I was like, oh, hell no. Nah. Oh, <laughs> shit. Oh, shit. There is a picture online of me and Rampage with our tops off. If you Google it, you can find it. And it's very, very embarrassing. Because, you know, Rampage, <laughs> you know, he's, he's, I mean, Rampage is the man. Shout out to him. Um, he's got all the bling and the big chains and everything. I'm from the north of England. We don't wear shit like that. But I was all skinny. <laughs> And I've got his fuck. I've got, I've got my shirt off, and I've got his chains on, and I look like an absolute <laughs> dickhead. Hey, you're only young once. We're having fun. Yeah, yeah, man. Speaking of sly old dogs, speaking of being only young once, this is a segue. Oh god, here we go. Oh god. Oh man, bad, look at this, <laughs> Brian. You're fired. Um. You must have seen this news this morning. I've got to get your take on this. Dean, you've been around the fight game forever. You can't stay in your prime, right? And, and we're not talking about somebody in their prime. We're talking about, I'm talking about Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson oh, is God. 58 years old, taking on Jake Paul. I've come out and I did a, did a couple of tweets on it. You know what I mean? People think I'm being a hater. People think I'm being jealous. You know, as we know, Jake Paul's doing his thing. What the hell? No, do you no, this, 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 this is, is this ridiculous. is not doing this is not doing your thing. This is absolutely ridiculous. And I couldn't I couldn't be more upset by this because yeah. now this is just taking it too far. I get it, man. Okay, you want to fight a couple guys in their early 40s and still think they got it. But you're gonna be fighting a man that's almost 60 years old. And the problem with that is that I talked to some guys today who don't really know a lot about fighting. And they really were like, oh man, Jake Paul's gonna get beat up by Mike Tyson. And I was like, He's almost 60 years old. So the fact that there are people that believe that this can be competitive or that Mike Tyson's going to win this, I was like, man, you're crazy. He's almost 60 years old. There's, and Jake Paul ought to be ashamed of himself for doing this. He ought to be ashamed of himself for calling out Mike Tyson to try to fight the legacy and the history of what Mike Tyson has done. That's, that's embarrassing. That's exactly what I said on Twitter this morning to him directly. I said, you should be ashamed of yourself because <sighs> what does he gain out of this? What, what is he going to do? Is he going to go out there and legitimately try to knock out Mike Tyson? Because if you do that and, it, and you're successful, when a man that's almost 60 years old, that's just disgraceful if you ask me. And then, God, for, I mean, it'd be amazing to see, but it's highly unlikely because Mike Tyson's probably got one round in him if possible, right? And the power's the last thing to go. If Tyson was successful and managed to find that shot, I mean, that'd be incredible. But what does he think he's achieving? I have no idea. I mean, think about when we saw Evander Holyfield and Vitor Belfort. I mean, it wasn't even competitive. And you, you have to take into account, I mean, I'm 47 right now. And I can't fight nobody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. At 47, I couldn't imagine fighting a 25-year-old. I couldn't imagine it. Yeah. And the fact yeah. that he's doing this and calling him out after all he said about the fight game and helping fighters and all this, I want to help fighters make money, blah, 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 blah. This is his way of giving back to the game and, and putting boxing on the map, calling out Mike Tyson. Come on, man. If you want to help yeah. Mike Tyson, allow him to be to be the special guest referee. Yeah, 100%. And the, and the way that he did it as well, he put on Twitter this morning, there's a video of him and Rafael Caldera hitting pads. And he said, oh, one of my promoters or whatever sent me this two weeks ago and said that Mike Tyson is interested. And when I look at this, I'm like, yeah, yeah, this really excites me. Heavyweight, let's do it. I'm like, dude, how stupid do you think the buying public is? Do you really think people are buying this? Listen, fair play to Mike. Go out there, do you think? I hope he makes a shit ton of money. More importantly, I hope that he's okay. But we, I mean, at what point, as a man, as a man, do you allow this to happen when you're in your prime? I don't, man, I don't get it. I, To me, I feel like commissions should step in and go, This we're not going to allow this to happen. I mean, what other sport do you know where a guy is almost 60 years old and still can get in there, except for golf, maybe? But like you couldn't, you could. They're not going to let a a sixty year old play football or basketball. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous why this is going to even happen. This should not even happen. Like you said, if Mike Tyson were to able to land that punch and knock him out, I mean, that'd be a gift from God. But it's unlikely. It's highly unlikely that that's going to happen. So the thing with Jake Paul is, we don't want him to be good. That's it. We just we don't want him to be good because he's he talks a lot. He's a YouTuber. You know, we just we want him to suck. But he doesn't. The reality is, is yep, he yep. doesn't suck. And he spent the last four or five years 
spent millions of dollars to have the best resources in the world and the best coaches in the world and dedicated himself to the sport of boxing. I was in, in the corner of Tyron Woodley when he knocked him out. It was heartbreaking. Watching Tyron Woodley go face first into the canvas, I wanted to completely quit combat sports at that moment because I was like, it ain't worth it Like to watch my friend get hurt like this. Yeah. And so Jake Paul can fight. Let's make no mistake about it. He can fight. He fights better than what we wanted him to be able to. But the fact that the commission would allow this is, to me, is a disservice to combat sports. It is a disservice. And Harrington, our producer, just put it in the notes. 50 is the age limit for the senior uh, tour in golf. So he's way past that. Um, (laughs) He's way past that. So my thing was this. Look, Listen, to be fair, we're all trying to make money. Okay, Mm -hmm. money makes the world go round. It is a vital part of Western culture. Everybody needs money. Okay, and the more of it, the better. Of course, he's made money. And I'm not just sitting there trying to rip on Jay Popper. He's got money. By all accounts, he makes millions of dollars every time he fights. From the YouTube side of things, he's made millions and millions of dollars. At what point, as a man, do you just say, it's enough? I don't need to do this. And I know we're going around in circles here, but it was just an extra point that I just thought of. It's like, dude, you've got the money. Take on some real boxes. Be a fighter. Challenge yourself. I, I, I don't know, man. Honestly, and me and me and Anthony Smith talk about this all the time. Like, I'm just not a greedy person like that. I, I mean, I need, I got, I got to make money, and I got to live the lifestyle that I want. And it's not yeah. lavish. I, you know, I just, I want to be able to eat at McDonald's whenever I feel like it. You know, that's it. I don't need anything. I don't need a Lamborghini yacht. But these guys, like, at what point do you just go? All right, man, this is this is enough money. I don't need to sell myself out for money. And I feel like these guys are selling themselves out for money while they're already rich. And it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, the cost of Big Macs is going up, Dean Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the order when you go to McDonald's? What's your favorite? Oh, man, I always... I, don't, I never really get the Big Macs, man. I always... Honestly, Mike, I always order off the dollar menu, man. I'm always like, well, and, it's not <laughs> even, and it's not even a dollar menu no more. It's not even really a dollar menu no more <laughs> because they're like a dollar ninety nine now for the for like the double cheeseburgers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do love a good double cheeseburger from McDonald's. Uh, I can't let you out of here without getting your thoughts on the main event, Sean O'Malley, Cheeto Vera. Mm. Obviously, a rematch. Cheeto's the only person to beat him. What is your thoughts on this one? I always go back and forth with picks and it just takes the right person to convince me. Um, and, and it might've been you this time, you listening to your take on Cheeto bringing in the right partners and knocking them out. Like I was like, I was, when we were talking, we we're listening to that. I was like, there might be something to that. You know, there might be something to that because I think Cheeto with, especially with five rounds, Cheeto has an ability to beat guys that are better than him. Guys that are more skilled, more technical because he has this, uncanning ability to touch you and hurt you and then make you not as good as you once were in the beginning of the fight. I feel as though if Cheeto can do that, he'll beat Sean O'Malley. He's got five rounds to try to find a few shots to hurt O'Malley and make O'Malley start making mistakes. And I think he could put him away. Um, so I kind of think like, as of right now, I kind of think Cheeto can do this. I think he could pull it off. You know, I'm glad you brought that up uh, about, you know, when I said that Cheeto was knocking out some of his sparring partners, Perillo told me he wasn't being a dick about it. You know, right? Yeah, I, been, I get that. No, I get. You've that. been around the game a long yeah. time. That just sometimes happens because, yeah, come on, we've all seen sparring par- partners get knocked out. You want to respect your training partners, of course you do. But sometimes when you're throwing down and it's the perfect shot, punch, kick, whatever it is, sometimes shit happens. Yeah, listen. At this at this stage, man, like not many people get a title shot. Not many people get opportunities to fight for a title. If you get an opportunity to fight for the title and you knock a couple partners out, man, that's collateral damage. Yeah. You know, it's you you gotta you gotta pull out all the stops in order to try to make your dream come true because not many people get an opportunity to do it. And even if you do it, it doesn't last long. So mm-hmm. when you have that opportunity, take full advantage of it. And if a couple people get knocked out in the process, and you can say sorry afterwards. Yeah, exactly. And it feels good. It's good going into those yeah. fights. No, yeah, you yeah, drop some yeah. You want to? You want listen? You don't want to go into a fight beat up. Talk about yeah, man. I got my ass kicked all camp. You want to go into a fight thinking, man, I I do have the ability to hurt somebody. Yeah, but it's funny though because sometimes that does happen. I mean, I've had training camps. I I talked about it. You probably saw it. I've had training camps where I did get my ass kicked, where things just weren't going well. 
You know what I mean? And I went out and had the best fight of my night or, or of my yeah. career up until that point. I've had the ones where I looked fantastic and then come fight night, I can't put it together. Yeah, sometimes it sometimes it doesn't correlate. It doesn't. Yeah. And and that's just MMA, really. That's just MMA. It doesn't make sense. MMA doesn't make sense because no matter what you do, when you're in that cage for 15 minutes, you just can't control it. Yep, yeah, exactly. Well, Dean, thank you for your time today, brother. I see you're in the car. What's the plan for the rest of the day? Oh, man, I'm just chilling, man. I'm just hanging out, getting ready to suit up so I can go down to the Kaseya Center on Saturday night. There but, man, go. I appreciate you, Mike, man. I can't wait to catch it up, catch up with you again soon. My man, Dean. Take care, brother. Enjoy the weekend. All right, y'all. Be cool, man. Peace. Take it easy. There he is. The one and only Dean Master of Cravat Thomas. Thomas.